Okay, how is everybody today? Wonderful. Yay! Okay, I don't want everybody falling asleep after they eat like that, okay? So I'm going to try and keep everybody um, excited, you know? Because I know how exciting open houses uh, pre presentations can be, right? So thanks for coming, everybody. Uh, how many people have been in the business five years or less? Oh. Okay, <laughs> five years or less. Okay, five years or more. Okay, 10 years or more. Okay, 12 years or more. 15 years or more. Okay, so, wow. you got, so we got some pretty uh, experienced people here. So that's right. good. So for you people who um, yeah. are kind of getting started in the business, the best way to get started is open houses. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about me. I um, graduated high school, went into the Navy, spent four years in the Navy traveling around the world, and had a great time. And uh, came back, went to work for Kelly Temporary Services as a secretary because I had, uh, when I was in the Navy, I was what they call a yeoman, which is like a secretary to the skipper of the ship. So I could type, I still type to this day, like 150 words a minute. I'm really fast. Yeah. So uh, went to work for Kelly Temporary Services, had various assignments around the valley, uh, wound up getting one at Xerox Corporation as a receptionist. And I worked my way up from receptionist to a telemarketing person. That's kind of when I started getting into sales because I did a lot of phone work. And uh, that was back in the day. This was back in, uh, just to give you some perspective, this was back probably, let me think now, this is in the late 1980s, okay? So uh, we had just gotten computers and all that kind of stuff. So we were just kind of getting into, like right now, everybody has a CRM. Right, everybody's got the you know to manage their contact database, client database. We didn't have any of that back in those days, but we were developing them and doing all that kind of stuff. So I did the telemarketing gig for about a year or so, and then they had a a uh, uh, an area open up in uh, the Southwest Valley, kind of the uh, downtown Phoenix slash uh, Levine you know, those kind of areas down there. Now this is back in the 80s, so this wasn't as nearly as developed back then. So they couldn't fill the job. Nobody that sold Xerox copy machines or fax machines wanted the job, wanted that area, because it was all like scrap yards and, you know, farms and stuff like that. So it was a hard way to make a living. Uh, they couldn't fill the position uh, for about eight months. They were looking for somebody who had a four year degree, all that kind of stuff. I didn't qualify because I never went to college. But, uh, I got lucky, like I have many times in my life, because uh, it was one of those deals where, you know, they figured, eh, we might as well put somebody in there, right? <laughs> if, you know, if we can't get somebody, let's just throw a nail in there. What do we got to lose, right? So they put me in there, and uh, I did that job for about three years, and I was lucky enough to be successful in it. It was hard work, but it trained me a lot in, in sales. And the reason I'm telling you this is because I'm going to get to it later that what you guys are really, we're not in the home selling business, right? We're in the people business, okay? So you got to have that mindset. We're not selling homes, we're building relationships, okay? So I did that job with Xerox and uh, then bumped into a buddy of mine, uh, Mike Valentino. We've gone to high school together. He worked at the uh, Wigwam Resort as a national sales manager. And uh, we hadn't seen each other because I'd gone off to the Navy and then I got married. You know, we had all this stuff going on. And so he said, well, come out, check it out. So I went out and saw what he did for a living. Took people golfing, took people out to dinner and things like that. And I thought, wow, this is the kind of sales job I want. So I went to work for uh, a place called the Scottsdale Plaza Resort. And I worked there as a national sales manager for about 10 years. And it was a great job. My clientele were uh, pharmaceutical companies and medical equipment companies. So uh, my clients were in New York and New Jersey, mainly the East Coast. So I did a lot of traveling. Uh, I'd spend maybe one week a month uh, in New York or New Jersey or one of those places or all of the above, meeting with my clients, building relationships again. Like I'm telling you, we're in the relationship business, not in the home selling business. So I did that for 10 years. And everything was going really great until 9-11 happened, right? So here we go again. 
I was making all this great money and we had just bought the house that by the way we're in still to this day and uh, within a week after we closed 9-11 happened and I was out of a job because there was no way to make any money in that business. Of course, my clients were in New York and New Jersey. I couldn't just call them up and say, hey, how would you like to bring all your people on a plane out here to Phoenix, right? So uh, I was scrambling. And so I felt sorry for myself for maybe, I don't know, a week or so. And then the fear started coming in. The good thing is my wife has always been a saver. I'm a spender, she's a saver. So we had some money, we had a little room, a little, you know, a little bit of a room there to, uh, to take off. So I, uh, I had this epiphany. I go, you know, real estate, huh, wait a second, real estate. It's kind of the same in a way. I'm selling, you know, homes instead of selling rooms and meeting space and food and beverage and all that, I'm selling homes. And it's a people thing. The more I started thinking about it, the more I thought, wow, well, in the resort business, I'm limited to what I can sell. Because once you've filled the space and you've filled the rooms, if somebody wants to come in over those same dates, you're out of luck if they can't move their dates, right? Not the same with real estate. I thought, wow, wait a second. I got unlimited, unlimited potential with real estate. So I went and got my real estate license, went to work for Century 21, Arizona Foothills. Um, I got in right after, soon after 9-11, and the market did this. It just took off like it has now, right? I was making money hand over fist, and I was like, whoa, went out. Okay, I told you my wife's a saver, I'm a spender. Well, we wanted to redecorate the house, so that kind of changed a little bit, right? So now we're out, and we, you know, $10,000 slab for the kitchen countertop, you know, $8,000 rug. This was the Tuscan days. So my house literally looked like Dracula's castle when we were done, but my wife liked it. So, you know, I'm gonna keep it that way, right? Now we've since changed it. Now we're all modern and uh, minimalist, okay? But anyway, so the reason I brought that up is we also have to watch our money. So I was spending money getting this house remodeled and everything was going great. And then, then what happened? Orange meltdown, boom, I'm broke again. <laughs> you know what I mean? So it's like that all your life, okay? And so now, you know, I've been a top producer for a while and things are going good. But I drive, uh, well, I just got a new little car, but before that I drove a Prius, had 250,000 miles on it, right? Before that I had another Prius that had 375,000 miles on it. Oh yeah, I mile my cars up, but I don't drive fancy cars. People that work for me drive fancy cars, but I don't, okay? You guys always want to watch your money, so be careful. But when I got into the real estate business, I had no money. Remember, I was broke because 9-11 happened. I had no money to spend on any kind of marketing or anything like that. So I thought, what am I going to do? How am I going to go out there? And, you know, I go to these seminars and they say, oh, you know, you, should, you can do this. You can do mailers. You know, you can do blah. This was all before Zillow, by the way, and all that kind of stuff. So you just were kind of out on your own. But I thought, you know what? I'm going to do open houses because number one, it doesn't cost anything, really. I mean, you're not spending a ton of money on the open house, except for handouts and things like that, which you can get some of your corporate uh, partners, you know, your lenders and your title companies of the world to produce that for you. So I started doing my open houses and I found that I was actually pretty comfortable doing open houses. And this is where it gets back to you being in the people business. Right? If you can't make that connection with somebody at an open house, you're never gonna get to sell them something. They have to feel comfortable with you. You have to be, you have to be able to uh, you know, melt yourself into whatever way they want to communicate so that they feel comfortable communicating with you, right? So I started doing the open houses and I found that they were very successful. Um, I was lucky enough to get my first listing from an open house. And um, what I hope to share with all of you today is the tips that I've learned over the years. And in fact, I've learned most of my stuff and become successful by making tons of mistakes. I mean, thousands of mistakes, okay? So hopefully you guys can keep from, uh, I can help you not make some of the same mistakes I did, okay? So let's start out with, um, I mean, I gave you guys this. 
about safety tips. We all know how important it is to be safe when you do an open house, okay? I don't even know if we need to go over this. You guys can kind of read this later. Uh, but I want you to have it. It's super important, even for guys, okay, you guys? You guys got to be safe, too, because uh, there's a lot of scams going on out there. Um, I remember one time I had uh, a, and not a, this wasn't a physical scam, which we always have to worry about. This was just another scam where a woman came in with two, three, I think it was three teenagers or three kids. And they came into the open house just to look and they were all nice and all this kind of stuff. And they all split and went opposite directions, right? Mm -hmm. One kept my attention. And they went and they uh, unlatched the garage door opener straight from the chain, okay? And came back later on and ripped the house off. So you know you gotta always watch for stuff like that, right? You never know. Medication in the cabinets and all that. So just safe tips. Even the guys gotta watch out for stuff, okay? So let's move on to my little presentation now. Six ways to bag clients at your open house. Okay? How many people here do open houses? On a regular basis? I was doing more before the pandemic. What's that? I backed off. The right, and a lot of us have. Yeah. Okay, I just literally re-upped mine about two weeks ago. Okay. Okay, so we're back in action. In fact, we did one two weeks ago in Goodyear, and we picked up two buyers and one listing in one Sunday afternoon. Okay, so so tell me who, who doesn't do open houses or hasn't yet? I just got started, so I haven't yet. Okay, you haven't yet? No. And you? Brand new agent. Okay, so you haven't done any yet. Okay, so let me start with uh, with picking the open house. One of the most important things you can do is pick the right open house, okay? If you're sitting in a place where it takes five turns to get to it, you're dead. Don't even, don't even sit that one, okay? You're lucky that you're with a company like my home group where we've got lots of listings, so you can reach out to your, hold on a second, it's ringing in my hearing aids. Let me get rid of this call. <clears throat> Sorry about that. Um, you wanna pick the right open house, that's the most important thing. You don't want one that's got a lot of turns to get to it. You want maximum three. Uh, one is the best, right? So you first you have to identify the house, and I want you guys to start identifying the house not like Thursday night. You want to identify your open house, and this is going to sound a little crazy because the homes are selling quickly, but you can sit a pending house. You want to do it two weeks ahead. Okay? The reason I tell you this is because I don't want you wasting your time. And there's a lot of pre-work that you have to do before you go and you sit an open house. I figured that out because I was going to do that last minute. I'll sit your open house. And I was like, oh shit, I need this, 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 this. Right. And you showed up, and, and you know what's better showing up at the last minute than not doing it at all? Yeah. Because you still have the benefit of learning by interacting with people. Okay? But you'll get much better at it, much more effective. But you're right, if you wait until the last minute, then all of a sudden you start thinking of all these things. So let me do this. Let me just show you something. When, when, you, when you identify the open house, first you want to try and go, let's do it this way. Let me see. I want you guys to start taking notes, okay? So let's see here. I think we can do a, uh, let me see here, this setup here. I'm going to do a search first. Let's do it this way.
How can I do this? Will it work? Will this work? <coughs> you got it. Is it going to let me find it? See, I usually set my own listing, so I was going to show you guys how to find it. Oh, here it is. Can right you there. type the name in there? Yeah. Oh, you get a keyboard. I was just telling you guys I was a quick typer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's got to be the right keyboard. Okay, so we're going to go my home group. And we got active listings, okay? So now it's gonna pull them up on the map, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, let's take it a step further and let's find the ones that are vacant, yes. right? Yeah. A little bit easier, right? Okay, so let's see here. How do we do that? Let's go down here. Type it Under what? Occupancy. Under there with an add a field. Yeah. If you type vacant uh, in there. Yeah. Let's try that. V A C A. There it is. Uh, there we nice. go. So we'll go vacant. Okay. Now, let me shut this down. Okay. So now we have a list of the vacant <coughs> my home group listings. Okay. So, now the next step you want to do is you want to make sure it's not gated. If you're in a gated community, you're screwed. Right. Okay. So, let's go, is that, what would that be under? Under that same box you were at. Wait, gated. Wait, wait. I disagree with the gated. It's okay. Just telling you, because first of all, I can always get the phone number because they have to call me. And Cheryl's making a really good point. And the accurate phone number. Yes, she's making a good point. Okay, so what Cheryl said, and uh, and she's not incorrect, is that if you do do a gated community, right, they got to call you for the code. The code. And so, go ahead, sir. So, I think sometimes the only downfall with that is they have to have your number, and some gated communities will not let you put your sign on the box. That is correct. To give you a call. That is correct. Some of them will, but I've had some of them where... Oh, I have never had one. I have. Oh. I had a guy take my feather banner once. <laughs> it was up in Troon. And he uh, took, because I had it outside the gate, yeah. and he took my feather banner and he threw it down in the ditch. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah! And then called me and said, your, <laughs> and texted me actually, your feather banner is in the ditch I don't want to see that trash in front of my neighborhood again. Hmm. So of course it was unknown, so I couldn't respond, right? But I would have responded and I would have said, oh, well, sir, I, I'm sorry, but uh, if I sell this house quicker, then, you know, I'm going to get more money and it's going to put, you know, it's going to make the, you know, the values of your neighborhood go up, but, you know, he's stupid, but, <laughs> so, but, sh you know, Cheryl is right about that. You can do gated. I would say do it gated after you're, a little bit more experienced and you've been doing it a while okay because you are going to get some flack from people that live in the gated community right because they've got I don't know I shouldn't I don't want to categorize people that live in gated communities however they just have a certain different way of doing things sometimes you know what I mean so I have a question real quick uh, yes so I've been targeting stuff that's been close to my house not necessarily I, I did the my home group initially, but at the time it was it wasn't close to me, and I just had a lot going on. So I've done other broker listings at the open house. Yes, don't, don't get caught doing that. Yeah, they so they yeah, the phone yeah, don't get caught doing that. Yeah, yeah, that's a violation. Is it? Yeah, because it it creates an agency that's confusing. Because you have one listing that's the agency, and then you have another competing company that's sitting at, and it can get messy. Gotcha. But I like the idea that you're, you know, hitting it hard. I like that. See, I always have been of the opinion that ask for forgiveness, <laughs> then ask for permission. Right? That's always a good way to go. Yes, sir. Sir, I, I just jumped in on this meeting today. Yep. What was your full name again? It's Neil N E I L. Brooks, B-R-O-O-K-S. 
you, you know, were, you were at Home Smart before, right? I sure was. Okay. Yeah, I thought I recognized you. Yes, I was. Uh, Great. I was one of the branch managers there for a long time. Until I came here, this place is, I don't know this place may, may, may I, may I, I try to ask a question? Am sure. I allowed to, or do you like just kind of hold oh, no, 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 I like questions. Keep oh. going. So, um, I was at HomeSmart in 2009. I wanted to ask you a question. Because you look familiar to me. Yeah, way. you look familiar too. And we've been, I've been in this business for about 20 years, so I know I've seen you around. Yes. So, the, um, you left HomeSmart and came here. Um, they have more listings at HomeSmart. Yes. But, obviously... My home group has a lot of listings too. Right. So that didn't phase you too much. You were very happy with the collegial attitude here. Very much so. Okay, that answers. The yeah, yeah. It's it's a little tighter here. I think you know nothing against uh, you know home smart. It's a great model. It's a big model, uh, but just a little different. Got yeah, yeah. different culture. Totally. Yeah. So, but it's successful in its own way. Yes. So, anyway, as far as getting the open houses, yes, you didn't really miss a step. Oh no. Because they have a ton of listings because um, of the agent count. Correct. But that doesn't mean there's a cult, the cultural dimension. You're you're you're. It's okay to have fewer listings, but as long as you have a tighter culture. That is correct. It's and a little bit have, Yeah. I mean, we got like two thousand listings usually, anyways, here at my home group. So it's yeah. like. You got plenty to choose from. That's a good. Yeah, yeah, I wouldn't even worry about it, and I think people here will be more open to you sitting in their open houses. So very good. All right, so let's put in gated. Okay. Uh, how do I put not gated? I would probably click on it first. Huh? Click on gated community first, and then yeah, and then it'll give you the option. Oh, okay. There we go. Yeah. Not gated. Okay. Good. Cheryl, I'm sorry. I, I agree with you though. Okay, so now you guys see this. So now this is part of your planning, okay? So now what you're gonna do is you're gonna zoom in on the map first, okay? And you're gonna find which ones you like. Now, obviously, uh, it really depends. Now, people will go at different price. When I first got into the business, I was like, I want to be a luxury agent. I mean, why would I waste my time, you know, with these little normal houses when I could make so much money off of just one deal, right? So I'd want to go sit those big houses, right? Mm -hmm. I think it's a mistake, it okay? I, I've always believed or I learned after a while, sell to the masses, not to the classes. Yes, sir. I think with the um, like the luxury houses too, most mm -hmm. of the people that come to those, they already have an agent. Like they've already bought so many houses. They already have their relationship established. They just want to see the house. But if they like it, they're going to contact their agent. That's correct. He is 100% right about that. Um, <clears throat> also, there's a lot more liability in those houses. Um, I do sell luxury listings too. Okay, I don't throw them out of bed for eating chips, but uh, I've made a lot more money selling regular houses, you know, than luxury listings. I mean, you can imagine, you know, you sell four or five, that's easy to do, four or five a month of a home, you know, a $350,000 home, that's a million something in real estate right there, right? Every month, boom, 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 boom. So, uh, and you have a lot less uh, problems, you know, I was sitting in a luxury, one of my luxury listings once, and the couple came in, and the gentleman, uh, you know, I had to step, there was a step down when you come in, and I had it marked, but he still fell, and they sued me. They sued me, and they so sued the homeowner. Jeez. Right, correct. I got lucky. You know you had it marked, wow, that's crazy. Right, I was lucky uh, that at the time, the company that I was with, it was Century 21 at the time, they had personal liability insurance. And by the way, if you guys don't have personal liability insurance, you may want to talk to your insurance agent about it. Because your E&O insurance does not cover a slip and fall in one of your open houses. Right? Somebody slips and falls, they see you as a rich real estate agent, they're going to go after you and after the homeowner. So that's why, and that's a whole other thing with getting luxury listings too. You get a rich person that gets pissed off. They got the means to go after your ass. 
and they will. You watch. Some of them, that's what they like to do because they're bored. So they, that's, they do it. Okay, just gotta be careful. So, back to the search, preparing for the open house. So, and keep asking the questions, I think it's good. So you have the map, so you're gonna wanna look at this map and you're gonna go, okay, where am I gonna get the most action? Okay, well we know that there's tons of action going in the north east, or northwest and the southeast right now, okay? You typically want to get something that's going to be newer because it's going to show much better, right? And it'll look better on your social media and everything else, right? So let's say we're going to pull one up. What's this one right here? This one looks good. This is in Vistantia <laughs> probably, right? Is that Vistantia? Okay, that's a new construction, so we won't do, we can't really sit that one. Um, what's this one over here? This looks like Stetson Hills. Maybe, maybe not. Okay, so let's open this one up. It went active on the 15th, 419. It's a good number. So let's check it out. Where is this at? What's the Stetson Valley? I was close. I was one over. Okay, so here's a vacant one that actually has furniture in it, it looks like. So let's look at the pictures. Okay, so let's go to the photos here. Now remember, you're going to be doing this two weeks in advance. You're going, why am I doing that so far out? I'll get to that in a second. Neil, right. I do have a question when you have time. Yes, go ahead. Um, so I start off with Southeast Valley. So I kind of have clients that pull me down there, a la Prius type of yeah. <laughs> Toyota product line. Yeah, it's a good thing. So, um, and then I, I live in Cell in Scottsdale. Okay. And what I, I was going to ask you just... You know, because everything you're saying totally makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, and you just said Northwest and Southeast. I was thinking, you know, I need to ask you this. Um, is there the, the low? It just seems like such a dogfight in the Northeast Valley. At it times. is. It, I don't know if that's just my imagination, but when I do open houses in Chandler, it's just like so much easier. And then I was curious about the northwest part of town and where the low-hanging fruit is and kind of what your thoughts are. Yeah, your uh, the low-hanging fruit is up in the northwest valley in the stream northwest in Peoria. Okay. And uh, you're going to want, I'll, I'll get on the map here and show you in a second kind of the areas you guys want to focus on right now. Okay, so here's the house right here. It was built in 2007. It looks very cute from the outside, right? It's a little two-story. Little office, that's where you can sit up your stuff if you want. Or you could do it in the kitchen. See, this would be a perfect one for somebody to sit. This is absolutely perfect. Let's look at the backyard and see how that looks. You, Neil, you're looking at floor plan too, like a big kitchen. Yes. And just, just the, I just sizzle, right? Yeah. Okay, now see, now this is a small yard. Yeah, you, I'm just looking for something that's clean and fresh. Okay, it's got, looks like, a, is it a three car garage? We're not sure. This is those ones that are on the smaller lots, but there's a lot of young families now that are so busy, they don't have time to have a big, huge yard and all that kind of stuff. See, it's got little playground stuff. It's a great little community. Okay, now the only problem with this one is maybe the access to it. Might be too many turns, because that's a big, long neighborhood. But let's look at it and see. So let me get out of this. Uh, Get out of this. Neil, Neil, if you have enough enough signs, does that help ease that a little bit, or even having enough turn so signs kind of? If you hit map and you zoom out, you can see the like how many. There it is. Okay. So uh, your question about the signs, yes, I mean I got a ton of signs, but you you do you want to try and keep it down to like four. Okay. If you can, four turns. Uh, that's not to say if it's the right house that you can't. So here we are on the map now. Thank you, sir, by the way, whichever one of you guys did that. I heard somebody over there. So let's back out. Okay, so you see the house right there. Here's the main drag. Okay. So off the main drag, you're going to have one, two, basically you could do two or three turns off the main drag, so that's a possibility. It's not bad. 
let's go back out further because see this is a long road right here so let me see here okay so I think what I gotta do is the main drag okay yeah so here here's Happy Valley Road okay so this one is almost to this is I think this is a borderline one but I would probably do one like this okay so you'll have one right you probably have to put another sign like here so two right you might have another one up here so that's three so that's three signs And you can do four, five. So it's almost six. So see, it's, it's close, right borderline. Now what I do with in a case like this, okay, and you have a main drag like this, you could do your signs out here. And there'll be other signs too, probably. There'll be other real estate people having their signs out now. You'll see more of that. So you're gonna put the signs up here. And I highly, if you guys really want to get into your open houses, invest in a feather banner. Okay, because the feather banners are great. You guys have seen those, right? They're easy to put together. You get sandbags to keep them up, and it gets the attention. I put the feather banner, like, right here, okay? Because you want to get massive exposure. That's what it's all about. You guys want to meet with people, and you want to be in the people business. Okay. Is that what you're pointing to? That's right, yeah. So I put the feather banner, like, right here. I see people put them in front of the house, but to me that doesn't work, yes. Oh, no, he was asking if we have the signs. Oh, okay. Um, you'd have to buy your own feather banner, and you'd have to buy your own signs. So, but, you know, and I do see people use those red and white uh, directional arrow signs and all that that you can buy for less money. You can do that, okay? If you're broke, like I was, then you can get the cheaper signs to get you in there and just have, you know, but you do want to have a nice sign for yourself. They're not all that expensive, and you may be able to get a lender or a title company to help pay for half of it, okay, if you build a relationship. Yes, pro, sir. Pro question for you. Yeah. Um, and I've done hundreds of open houses, too. Yeah. Uh, sign compliance in Scottsdale, where I've been, it's just they, they are on you. Like, mm -hmm. they really regulate you real tight. Sure. Um, and, that, you know, they take your signs, put them in their truck, and take off. Right. Uh, in that part of the valley, a little less a little less strict when you're out in the boonies a little bit? Yeah, you're going to want to check. What you're talking about is there are some communities that, uh, now, they shouldn't be touching your directional arrow signs if it's outside of a gate. Okay. If you're inside of a gate, okay, because it's private property. They can, the marshals or whatever, can come in and say, well, I don't want your directional arrow signs in trashing up our neighborhood. We don't want them in here and we don't want them in there. So it is important to check with no. the HOA before you do your open house. Yes, sir. Um, totally new. Where would I go to find that information? You'll find it on the MLS printout. MLS. On the very front page, right down about in the middle, it'll have all the HOA information with their phone number. The other thing you can do is you can go to the guard gate. And you should be going and checking everything out anyway. For the city, so let's say I'm in Gilbert, I'm not dealing with. Oh yeah, no the signage. Only if it's a gate. Gotcha. Do you have to worry about that? So the signage information for per city, you just go to the city uh, site. You could. Oh, so you just yeah. Okay. I wouldn't be overly concerned unless it's gated. If it's gated, then you can worry about it. All right, Neil. I wanted to ask you this. I've never used one of these. I'll um, get to you in a second. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut in front of you. No, yeah, why don't you go ahead? Yeah, go ahead. So, I was going to say, um, the other thing is where you have your sign. So, like some community centers, because that area is technically private, sometimes it's places like that that's actually taking your sign because they don't want the sign on their premise. Right. So like community centers. Uh, sometimes, like, if you have it, like, at a church or something like that. So, it's just a matter of, like, watching where you have some agents um like especially like if it's a, a busy business they'll put the sign right there just because they know they can get that traffic but those some of those people don't want it and they'll take it off right neil the feather sign you caught my attention on this 
uh, a feather sign is that the vertical sign it's yeah. quite tall yeah. so do you you like to use that on the mains like uh, a main drag like, that's uh, correct what is that I would Stetson put it out. Valley. Yeah, you could do. You could either put it on Stetson Valley, or you could put it at, at Stetson and Happy Valley, which is okay. Oh, the more right. of an arterial street, right? Yeah. So okay. that it gets their attention, they go into yours before they go into somebody else's. Now, since we're talking signs, make sure you never put any sign that would obstruct a sidewalk for somebody that has uh, mobility issues. Won't be able to get by it. Oh, so if they're in a wheelchair or whatever. Yeah, uh, never put it on a sidewalk. And it gives you a good opportunity to meet some of the neighbors because what I always do is when I'm putting my directional arrow signs and I'm putting, I'll go up and knock on their door and I'll say, hey, I'm doing it all, I'm selling your neighbor's house. Here's my business card. Do you mind if I put my sign in your yard for, uh, you know, for four hours? I've, I've only one or twice, once or twice had somebody go, no. I've got another question for you. Go ahead. I've got to ask you this. Keep going. Because I can tell you're really, I know how important these are. Yeah. I was going through my storage where I keep all my open house signs. Yes. And my, my frames are getting old. I yep. know it sounds like it's unrelated, but did you ever spray yours with like some kind of like a water resistant material? I should have. No, mine are all beat to hell. Okay, mine are too. <laughs> mine are too. Cause I was that gonna, shows you're making money. Yeah. I was wondering like if I should, if. Like buy buy some new ones and then just treat have a handyman and just treat them for me or you could something you could. like that. Yeah, well, the mine actually the mine are all beat up. They, they sit in the back of my trunk all the time. The buyers don't care. They're not looking at your size. Yeah, they're not looking at skeletons. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's it's okay. No, but it's not a bad plan. It's not a bad plan. Okay, so we got that. You guys got that right. Yes. You guys figured that out. Okay, now here's where we're going to take it to the next step. Okay, so this is Stetson Valley. Okay. So now we're going to go to Monsoon. So let me get out of this. This is where it gets fun. So you go into Monsoon. This is where you get strategic. Okay. Let's go into the tax search. Okay. We're going to go into Stetson Valley. And we're going to pull up homes. Statistically, people sell their home every five to seven years. Okay, so we're going to go back to 20. We're going to pull up the homes that sold between seven and five years ago in Stetson Valley. Okay, so we're going to go here. And we're going to go back to 20, what is that, 2014? Is it 2014, seven years ago? Sure. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So we'll go just January first. And then we're gonna go to twenty sixteen. And we'll just go January thirtieth. And we're gonna search. Okay, now there's a hundred and seventy five properties where the people are still living in them in that community where they purchased the house five to seven years ago. These 175 people are the ones that you're gonna to wanna to do a mailer to before your open house. That's why you gotta prepare for this, okay? You wanna send a mailer to these people, a really nice letter with your business card, because guess what, you're gonna get their listing right you're gonna go get their listing so they get all kinds of garbage in the mail these they get cards they get flyers they get this they get that you want to send a nice letter that's gonna make them open it up you know you can even put something on there like urgent what I used to do is I would do the uh, envelopes that had the little window in them so it looked like it was a bill <laughs> so that they would open it up without just shit canning it right away okay so you do things like that. It's a little subtle, but it moves the needle, okay? And this doesn't take a lot for you guys to do. You can download all of these automatically into a spreadsheet and you can do your own, because I had no money, right? I could do this kind of stuff, but I had no money to do this stuff. And guess what? When you're first in the business, the title companies, the lenders, all, they, don't, they don't care about you. They're not gonna kick a lot of money in because you're not producing. Right? They'll give you a little bit here and there. 
But you're going to have to do your thing. When they really kick the money into you is when you don't need them anymore, right? Mm -hmm. So, but that's kind of how the way it works. Thank yes, you. sir. Um, unfortunately, you're right in, in front of the screen when you were doing stuff. I heard you talking, but right now I see the sale date being the year t uh, 2020. So, but you were saying you went back seven to five years ago, right? It's what it is. Is this is 2014? Ah, okay. Yeah. See, it's okay. 2014 to 2016. All right. So these people are all still in their houses. So these people are all targets, man. Look at this. Paul and Amber. They paid $580,000 for the house back in 2014. Right? Let's go to their... Can I pull up their tax? Here we are. This is their tax records right here. Okay? See? They're still in the house. Right? So if these guys get a letter... And you tell them, hey, I'm selling your neighbor's house. I'm having a special neighbors only open house from this time to this time. And I'm giving, I'm raffling off a $250 gift card, Visa gift card. Okay? You will be surprised how many people come through your open house. Okay? And these are going to be neighbors that are listing prospects. If you've got 175 prospects, all of these, by the way, when you send the letter out, what do they do? They go into your database, your CRM, right? Why would you want to go after people that just bought their house a year ago? Yeah, there's some of those that sell. We see them all the time. But you're statistically going to have a much greater opportunity right here, okay? So you're going to want to get that out at least a week before the open house. You're going to want it to hit there. You just got to strategically think about it. You want them to get it like on a Tuesday, Wednesday for that weekend and say, hey, I'm going to be here. Here's the thing. There's going to be this. There's going to be that. Oh, by the way, we're practicing social distancing and we're going to be careful. There's a lot of people out there that are being affected by COVID. I'm fully vaccinated. I hope you all are. If you're not, you should be. And, uh, but I know there's a lot of controversy about it. You got to do it, whatever you're comfortable with. But lots of people are dying now from COVID. I'm, I mean, everybody probably knows somebody who's died now of COVID. Does everybody know somebody who's died of COVID or somebody who knew somebody who died of COVID? Yeah, it's real. So you got to be really careful out there. And so you want to be, make sure that everybody knows that your open house is going to be sanitized, clean, and safe. Okay? So. You guys see what I'm talking about? This is a lot different, right, than doing a regular open house. This is what the kinds of things that you have to do. So we're almost out of time. We got about 10 more minutes, but I wanted you guys to see that. So one of the things that's important, rule number one, never plan to call people later on, okay? Because nine times out of 10, they're not gonna call you back. People have sign-in sheets and all that kind of stuff. You could do a sign-in sheet if you want, but I see the sign-in sheet as uh, kind of a barrier that you're putting up to somebody right when they walk in the door. It's almost like a prenuptial agreement. Yeah, who wants to sign that? Nobody. So, uh, so I, I really don't do the sign-in. So what you want to do is you're going to want to lock the front door. Okay, now, sometimes if you're super busy, you won't have time to do that. The reason I say lock the front door is because then you can meet the person at the front door, right? You're going to meet the person at the front door with your handout. You're going to give them the MLS handout, or I'm sorry, you're going to give them your flyer first, okay? And you give them a quick rundown. Don't shake their hand because a lot of people, especially now, they don't want to, you know, we used to go boom, you know, we'd be shaking the hand and doing all that kind of stuff. We don't do that anymore. Maybe the fist bump. So you meet them at the door, you introduce yourself really quick, you don't come on too strong, it's a people business, they're afraid you're going to attack them, so you just have to be really cool, you just give it to them, you go, hello, I'm Neil, who are you, try and remember their names, I forget them <laughs> within 30 milliseconds of them saying it sometimes, but I try and remember it. The way I remember people's names is by thinking of somebody else you know that has that name. That helps me. So when I get their names, and it's Holly, oh yeah, that's my sister's name, so Holly, okay. You know, I can remember it that way. Then you give them the MLS printout, and you say, okay, go ahead, and you guys wander, wander through the house. 
Okay. Then you, t I'm sorry, you gave them the flyer. Then you tell them to wander through the house. So they start wandering through the house. You walk out into the backyard, okay? Because you don't want to follow them around the house. That's the worst thing you can do. It's like when you go clothes shopping and the clerk follows you around. You don't like that. Let them go to the house or go to the backyard because they're going to go out to the backyard. And it will be more natural that way. This time you have the MLS printout in your hand when you're in the backyard. They come out into the backyard, you give them the MLS printout, and you say, okay, here's more details. The taxes, then you start giving them the taxes. Right? You, now you've given them two things. Now it's time for them to give you something back. Okay? That's when you want to get their story. And you want to be really casual about it. So you're going to say, if it's the, if it's, of course, if it's the neighbor's time frame, you're going to say, oh, are you a neighbor? You can even ask them that when they come in the door. Because people, if they are a neighbor, they feel embarrassed to even bring it up. So you want to get that, that elephant out of the room. And you ask them if they're a neighbor. Then you just want to, you know, if it's a neighbor, then you're all of a sudden going to go into your listing mode, right? Oh, well, the neighborhood, you know, homes have been selling in a blah, blah, blah amount of time. The average cost per, per square foot in your neighborhood is this. Oh, and by the way, here's a listing of all the active listings in the neighborhood. All of a sudden, they're like, wow, this guy knows a lot about what's going on here, right? And everybody perceives us all differently, right? They may perceive you as a young person who, why would I work with somebody that young, right? They don't know anything. Somebody might think that, right? With me, a young couple could come in and go, why would I want to work with this old guy? He doesn't know anything. He probably listens to Frank Sinatra, and I do. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right? We all have different things that people perceive of us. But you can overcome that by having information for these people, right? So you're talking professional, right? It's and it's something that they would all agree on. So if you know it's a neighbor, if you know it's a neighbor, you're gonna be in the listing mode. If it's somebody that is a potential buyer, you go, oh, are you buying or selling? Right? Then you're going into the buyer rep mode, where you're going to ask them, oh, are you renting right now? When does your rent expire, right? And you'll go as far as you can, but you got to feel it so you don't push too far. It's hard, right? But you get good at it. You get better at it as time goes on, okay? One of the things that we always, what's the biggest objection that a person has to an open house when you're trying to bag a client? The biggest objection is, I'm already working with someone, isn't it? That just shuts you right down, okay? So you gotta be one step ahead of them, okay? So what you're gonna do when the person, you know, at some point during that conversation, you're gonna say, so who are you working with, right? Who's your agent? And they go, oh, uh, I, don't, I don't have an agent, right? So it's easy if you say to them, are you working with somebody? What are they immediately gonna say? Yes, yeah. yes I am. Now, if you ask them a different way, boom, catch them off guard, right? And you get them. You nail them. It's just going to move the ball forward. That's what I'm talking about. Statistically, doing this kind of stuff, asking the questions the right way, you're going to move the ball forward, and you're going to get more listings and buyers. And you're going to look real professional. Okay? So, never plan on calling them back. You want to make a good impression on them so they want to call you back. Right? And then all of a sudden they start questioning and all this. You go, oh, yeah, you know, I can send it to you. What's your email? Right? All of a sudden, make sure you got something to write down that stuff. You can even do a sign-in sheet for yourself and you fill the stuff out. Don't expect them to fill it out. So you welcome the visitors at the door. Okay. Number three, stage your informational packets. Okay? So I've got, now this is copies, okay? And I'll, sit, I'll let you guys see these, but I have, I put these together. I put together a home selling process and a home buying process, okay? So you're gonna either have your listing people or you're gonna have your selling people. You put those together like with, with well, green, like one of your tile graphs? Right, I, well I haven't printed up. This is what they look like in real life. This is my listing presentation, okay? So even when I had no money, I would spend my money to get stuff done that's real high gloss, slicky, real nice looking kind of stuff, okay? So my listing presentation, I usually hold back, right? 
and if it's a listing prospect, I I might give them the home selling process, Isn't right? Black and white? They think they're huh? Isn't it black and white? No, it looks okay. exactly like this. It's these same colors and this same style. I just don't have. I didn't bring any. Okay. okay. So, but uh, but you guys are going to want to have these kind of handouts. Now they have here. You can push. Uh, hand those around so everybody can kind of look at them. Is that them. something my home group helps you with, or is that like? Uh, no, I I have a uh, lender that I do a lot of business with who paid for these. Wow. It's the thing is, you know, when you get into the business, you guys, and you're doing a lot of business, they'll pay for this stuff for you. When you're new in the business, you're not going to get anything. Do you um do you? I kind of like tend to scope out the property, you know, the area. Yes. Because if they're coming there, then I'll put like other homes MLSs that I know are active um, in there and pool without a pool condos everybody condos are always a hot button when you get all the seniors out that's there right thing. so I have that all prepared and I put it in a book then they really think I know what I'm doing it's, oh I have this one here and I have, right I don't know if it's my listing or something but else. you put it in a binder it's yeah. not in just sitting out yeah there. and I put it well because I, they're not going to get that they're right. going to come me to get that. That's so correct. Then they usually will say, well, let me, have you, let me give you my information because if there's something else that comes up, this isn't really what I'm looking for, but whatever. Uh, but it tends to, they tend to think that you just like work that whole neighborhood all the time because you've got all this stuff. You don't look at who's listing it is no. or whatever. That's um, correct. So That's it absolutely really right. does help if you have a buyer because they there's so many people out there that are on their own now out looking that we didn't usually have. And they do say they have an agent. They haven't signed a buyer broker on there. No, nine <laughs> times out of ten, there's no buyer broker. So I just like I just pursue it like you know. Right. They don't say it. They just you don't. I don't knock anything like whatever they might. But I just act like well, let me show you this or whatever, and then finally they'll say, well, yeah, maybe you can show me some properties. Right. You know, I mean, it doesn't hurt. You've got them there. You might as well. Cheryl was absolutely right. So, and not only that, you guys, but you want to know where the schools are, yeah. what type of school it is, where the private schools are, where the grocery stores are, where the nail salons, where the restaurants. You want to know where all that stuff is. You're going to do all of that before you're open. How do you find that? Yes, sir? What's How up? How do you find that? Just drive. Mm -hmm. Now, well, you can also... Well, title. title will get a book together for you, too, yeah. if you want to throw some title stuff in. That's true. You know, demographics. That's easy if you drive. Schools. You're learning yourself. That's good. Mm -hmm. right, yeah. I'll tell you what I do, too. Oh, hold on. I'll get you in a sec. I also take my um, my Google Map thing, my driving app, and if you put in, uh, like if you're standing, you know, in front of the house, and you put in nearby restaurants, you say oh. restaurant, it'll pull them all up. Right. Yeah. So, so you they could do it themselves, but you just do it. You do it, right. You're right. So you can just, yeah, because you'll find and out. And sign ahead. them up for the, um, my home group app. Right. You could then do that too. Go in and look at properties and see everything around there. But everything comes through you. Like it has my bio when it comes to them, all of that stuff, and my phone number is on my home. Group. So every time they're looking for something, they see something, they're going to call me. That's right. They're going to want to get well, into the app. Is in your name or connected to you? It's, it's all branded to me. Oh. Yeah, that's part of the benefit of being here, man. So go ahead. I like how you do this, where you're not just looking for buyers, but you're looking for sellers. That's correct. Right. And, and are, Neil, are you integrating this with a geographical farm, or um, is there any other uh, social media integration that we might want to think about? Great question. This is how you build your farm. Right here. There's 175 people now in your farm that have been in their house five years or more. Okay? You can even go further back than that. And that's where you get started, okay? But don't spread yourself too thin. Find like four of these farms. I mean, when I first got in the business, I was desperate. So I would try everything. I know it's easy for me to say this now, to try and be a little bit more strategic. But when you first get started, you pretty much gotta just do wherever the business will take you, whatever you can do. But as time goes on, you can get more and more strategic and build a farm. But this is how you start. If you're in there every, you know, weekend doing an open house. And just to give you guys perspective, when I got into the business, the first five years, I did an open house every Saturday and Sunday for the first five years, unless there was something that prevented me from doing it. Yes, sir. Why only weekends? Well, because I think we train the public to do the weekends. However, you'll see in my packet that I do say sometimes you can mix it up a little bit. I know I've had 
So when I used to do open houses all the time, like I've had days where I've had like a Wednesday be busier than like a weekend, but that's also because, so for instance, like if there's a school nearby doing an open house, like a later open house, because you know that those people will be dropping their kids off of school and some of those parents don't live in the area that they're supposed to and they need to move into those areas. Right. So yeah, so I've found that doing open houses during the week have been very successful. Right, and well. see, see, this is what we're talking about, the people business. This is a perfect example of being in the people business and how, uh, and how you're not selling houses. So you're cognizant of the fact that some Did people- Did you Hey, what's up? Up? what's up, bro? Yeah, we're doing the open house, man. Hey, thanks. That's Johnny Walker. We were in the Navy together. Yeah, we were in the Philippines at the same time. The Johnny Walker? Yeah, Johnny <laughs> Walker, baby. He's a good guy. But, uh, but yeah, so you're in the people business. Remember, you're in the people business, and that's a perfect example because you're saying, yeah, you know, there's some sometimes when there's like a, a Wednesday where the school's doing something and the people are in there, you know, and you're going to see more people, and you know that now, so you know about kids and schools, right? You have kids? Yes. Okay, so see? Thanks. All right, thank you, Cheryl, so much. Um, so yeah, so so that's that's really important. Yeah, you can mix them up. We do them primarily on Saturdays and Sundays only because we've trained the public to do it that way. Okay, you're always going to want to put it on social media. You guys know how to put it in the MLS, your open house? Okay. Okay. <laughs> you can go in If it's too. not your listing, you have to contact Yeah, if it's not your listing, you got to go into them and make sure that when you're sending somebody's listing, that they're putting all that in ahead of time. Make sure they're putting it on Zillow, Realtor.com, and in the MLS. And make sure to double check. Do you find there are certain times that are best? Uh, to do the open house? Mm -hmm. 1 to 4 p.m. is usually the best time, because that's we've kind of trained them to do it around that time, too. I do see some people doing them earlier, but it tends to work Sunday afternoons, 1 to 4 p.m. are the best. That's what I have found. So, I think it depends on the area too. It does. Like if you're in Sun City, yeah. you want to do it earlier in the morning because that's people are yeah, the, they're, they're they're shutting down at three. The Sun City is great for weekdays, especially early summer time of year. Yeah, yeah. This yeah. Is year with November, December, January, they're all vacation. Yeah, true. You want to do a North Scottsdale one? Or Sun Lakes, if you like the others. All the major street communities. Sun Lakes, you can do them all the time. Fifty-five plus, you can pretty much do them whenever you want, as long as it's earlier. Um, North Scottsdale, you know, that whole Scottsdale corridor, you know, over the next couple of months, you can pretty much do them for the, you know, the snowbirds. Hey, thanks, man, for coming in. Yes, sir. Uh, but yeah, you can do it for the snowbirds. Hey, Amy, I have a question. Uh, something you were talking about, the flyers and stuff. Yeah. I was doing some research beforehand, and uh, RPR uh, says that they will do 2,000 mailers for you, and you can get all the statistics and everything. I haven't done it. This is just stuff that I just read right now. Okay. Um, and I think we're already part of that. That's uh, RPR. Is They're not going to do it for free, I wouldn't think. I haven't been on the site to really know. Yeah, I have no idea. Okay. I really don't know. That's a good question. It's not really good to, you know, to investigate, but I mean. Yeah. No, mailers, you're usually going to have to pay somebody to do that. You know, you got to pay for the postage and all that kind of stuff. Right. So... Uh, but if you guys, uh, you know, don't have the money for the postage right now, if you're broke, you know, which like I was, you, I went door to door and I stuck the letters on the people's doors before the open house. And it, it was pretty interesting because I would do it on a Saturday before the Sunday and I would meet the homeowners sometimes. They're out washing their car, they're doing what? I just give them a letter and they go, wow, look at this. They never see a realtor working. Everybody thinks realtors <laughs> are lazy and a lot, most of them are. But they think, you know, that you just, and those are the ones that aren't making the money. And those are the ones that give you listings. Right. Because they see you working. That's right. That's how I got my first listing. The guy goes, oh my God, I've never seen anybody do this before. He goes, I'm thinking of selling my house. And I got it. Yes, sir. You know, I've done a lot of open houses in Scottsdale. Uh huh. And um, I w had, has, had asked you about where the low hanging fruit is, like where the geographical areas are. Right. And I don't want to reinvent the wheel. Um, I was thinking around along the same areas of Peoria and the Northwest as well, mm -hmm. and it's a little bit less agents per mile density, less agents. We there's a, we have a lot of agents that live in this northeast yeah, it's, part of town. They're everywhere. They're like locusts. Okay. Yeah. There, there are as many agents in the in, up there as there are down here. Yeah. They're really. 
Do you know how many active real estate licenses there are right now in Maricopa County? Around 10,000, I think. No, a little bit more than that. 60,000. 60? 60. Oh, well, you're right. 1,000. So they have an article subscription 10, and all that stuff. 60, not everybody practices. 60,000 active real estate licenses in Maricopa County. Wow. That's a lot. You gotta be different. You gotta be different. Well, and you guys will be different just by doing this stuff. Okay, this is going to increase your uh, production massively, and it's a great freaking way to get started. You know, I've got so much stuff going on, i got so many leads coming in from different sources I've developed over the years. I don't have time to do this anymore, but that's how I started it, and it's a, such a great way to do it, you know, and it's, it's just an amazing way, and you guys might think to yourself, oh, well, God, why, you know, they've got the eye buyers, they have the neighborhood specialists, they got all this... You would be surprised, even though there's so many agents out there, that a lot of people, you know, they get bombarded by so many agents that they, they don't really have any kind of a commitment or a relationship with any agent. And if they come into your open house and they see that you're hustling and that, you've, that you're, you're coming to them with information and all that kind of stuff, you can overcome being younger looking or you can overcome being older looking, you know, because you're providing them with information and you're being professional and you're not being too friendly or, or too not friendly. You know, you just gotta be really careful. You know, if you come over over friendly, you might seem like you're a phony. If you're, if you're too blase, then they're thinking, oh, this person's lazy or something. You know what I mean? So you just gotta try and, uh, you know, when the person comes in, you have to try and mirror their, the way that they are. If an accountant comes in and I'm like, hey, how you doing? I'm Neil, you know? The accountant might go, uh, uh, you know? But if the accountant comes in and I go, well, hello, I'm Neil Brooks. Here's some statistics, right? <laughs> you find out what they do. Here's some statistics. You can tell by somebody's demeanor a lot of times how they communicate, you know? Sometimes you can't. So, anyways, um, any questions? I mean, I know I didn't get through this whole thing, but I can kind of... You guys can, act, I guess, go through it your own because we're already six minutes over. Stage your informational packets. I approach visitors during the walkthrough. Yes. Number five, obviously, uh, you want to, you want the house looking as uh, best you can. But if, what if it's not your listing? Like, what us starting off don't have this team, we're having to go do someone else with this team. Yeah. I mean, yes, you want it to look good. Yes, you want it to, you want it to have like pride showing it. But check it out ahead of time. Yeah. And if it smells like dog piss and cigarettes, <laughs> don't, do don't do it. Yeah, because you'll walk out smelling that way yourself <laughs> after four hours. True. So, um, but yeah, you know, like I, when I'm doing an open house, I always bring a laptop because guess what? I can start calling my old prospects. I can do all kinds of work while I'm there. When people are coming in, they see that you're busy, you know, but you're not, you're not, you know, being like following them around, but you're being attentive, you know, you're being attentive to them. So get a lot of work done while you're doing your open house. Yes, sir. Uh, I, I have a question for you on open houses. As uh -huh. far as uh, the way you dress, uh, you know, yes. for the area and everything. How, do you, what kind of, for men, as far as dress tips, what would you say as far as? Yes, I would say dress comfortably so you feel comfortable. You know, uh, during the summertime, when I'm in North Scottsdale, I'm in a nice pair of shorts that are that are ironed. You yeah. know, I don't wear like cargo pants. You know, you want to be a streamlined. You want to look professional, kind of. You know, this is a professional kind of look. Yeah. You know, I don't look like I'm rolling out of bed or whatever. This is this is fine. Um, if you overdress, you might intimidate the people. Yeah. So you want to be just kind of... Yeah, I was curious about that because I used to wear a suit and everything. And sometimes that was a bit much for some people. It is. It's way too much. I did the same thing because I came from a thing where I had to wear a suit and tie, you know, in my business before. And so I felt professional when I was doing that. But it was a turnoff to a lot of people, you know, because they're like, oh, geez, you know, this is, you know, I feel like I'm, I don't know, you know, it's kind of weird. So, so here, there yeah, I mean, you can wear golf attire when you're up in the Scottsdale area, you know, golf shirt with some slacks. All that kind of stuff. The ladies, of course, they want to dress professionally. They don't want to dress too provocatively or anything. Just kind of middle of the road, yeah. and uh, it'd be fine. Yeah, but yeah, I wouldn't overdress. 
So hopefully this has been helpful to everybody. Yeah, I really like you guys pick up some tips. I did. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Okay. So I'm bad with like bad with names, so I used to have like you know just like a little memo pad. Yeah. So I can jot stuff down, but it also helps because like if they have kids. Like if you can remember something about like the kids, oh yeah, you win them. You got them. You win them right See, there. So you have the keys. So I jot down, like so when they introduce themselves, I always ask them, oh, "What's your name?" You know, it's the kid. You write down the kid's name as well. So that way, even when you follow up, you be like, "Oh yeah, by the way, how is John so Yeah. And then as soon as you can name one of their kids by name, it's over. He's right. Go ahead. Uh, that's true because I just did an open house and I had a few families come through and. <laughs> they actually expect the house backed up to my my kids elementary school mm -hmm. so that was always an easy connection and whatnot. right but my question was I had a hard time getting um, them to sign in and stuff they right come in, don't do it don't do it no I don't ever have anybody sign in because well, it just turns them off so what you do is just walk in, you let them do their thing, and then you know you strike up a conversation with them. Remember, let them go through the house with a flyer, go out to the backyard. They're going to eventually go out to the backyard, right? Sometimes they don't. Sometimes they sneak out the front. <laughs> but they'll come out to the back 99% of the time. Then you give them the MLS printout, and that's when you start asking, try and get their story. You know, if, if they feel like, you know, they're talking to you a little bit, and you're just being friendly and relaxed, and at some point, you know, you can come up with some reason why you got to send them something. Like, for instance, if they live in the neighborhood, they go, oh, you know what, what's your email? Give me your email real quick. Don't even ask them, would you like to give me your email? Just say, hey, why don't you give me your email real quick? I'll email these to you. What's your email? You know, and then you write it down. Like, have a little pad, like this gentleman over here. And you write that stuff down. And yeah, when people come in, uh, after I give them the information, I try and remember their name, and I'll write their names down really quick and then have it with me, right? And then kind of go and do my thing. So that at another point, if you're calling somebody by their first name, when they're coming into your house, they're gonna, they immediately pay attention more. And they feel like you're listening. And everybody wants to be listened to. Everybody wants to be heard. And so it's super important that you let them be heard. Don't talk too much. Try and make them talk more. Ask open-ended questions, not yes-no questions, right? Open-ended questions, right? If they're not asking, if they're not talking, then you can do closed-end questions. So are you in a lease right now? Yes. When does it expire? Boom. Okay. So what kind of a home are you guys kind of looking for? I mean, are you looking to move into this area? Then they start talking to you, right? Then you start getting their story. But you got to probe a little bit. Can't come on too strong. It's the people business. We're not in the real estate business. We're in the people business. Okay, keep that in your mind. You sound like Tommy Hopkins a little bit. Do I? <laughs> yeah. Which okay. is good. I've never even heard him. That's a compliment. Oh, it's thank old you. time real estate. I know Hopkins, but I haven't heard any of his things. But he's yeah. right if he says that. Because yeah. it's very true. Okay, so you guys kind of get that, right? Hey, Neil, a little I, different. I, I got one question. Yes, go ahead. If I, okay, let's say I'm a buyer coming into your open house. Yes. And I come in and you ask me that question, are you working with a realtor? No, you don't ask it that way. No, what, what were you, how did you say it again? Who's your realtor? Who's your realtor? Okay, now I'm going to be the agent. Well, or who are you working with? Okay, I'm going to be the buyer. Okay. Um, yeah, I've got someone, oh, you say who's your realtor? Yeah, you're the buyer. You walk in the door, okay? And so we're talking. Hey, how you doing? And I'll go, by the way, who, who are you working with? Oh, it's just like that. Can't remember his name. Right. Or he could, they could say that. Or, or, or they, they just can't remember the name. They, they, they get embarrassed. They go, oh, I'm not working with anybody. Uh, you can uh, also ask them, like have, they, that's, have that's they been like, out looking at houses? Because if they haven't been, then they don't have an agent that would actually that's show true. them houses. But they might just say, yeah, I have that. That's true. So, yeah, it's the quickest way. It's, hey, who are you working with? You just slide it in there when they least expect it. Neil, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. So, as far as food and all that kind of stuff, you guys, get that indestructible stuff that's already prepackaged. You can carry around in your trunk for months. <laughs> <laughs> you don't ever have to worry about it, right? doesn't go bad. Oh, with uh, COVID, too. What's that? I said with COVID. That's right, exactly. People want that prepackaged, you know, and have it all laid out so nobody else is touching it, right? No Debbie snack cakes. That's it. They last forever, man. They do. <laughs> they really do. The kids love them. Any other questions? All right, well, you guys get out there. Come on now. Thank Let's you. get out there. Plan it out. 
you guys saw how to do it. Make sure you get those mailers out before you do your open house. It's going to increase at least double the amount of people you're going to get through. And they're going to be higher quality. Do you make them smaller or pretty big? What's that? Like the mailers? Or do oh, you yeah. still do the envelope? No, I do the envelope. With, okay. the, with the little window envelope and all that kind of It takes more time. That's what I'm saying. you got to do it ahead of time. It takes more time. And do you make them, since it's in that envelope, like regular paper? I do. And make it just look like a Absolutely. Note? It has okay. my it has my uh, logo on the top, you know, my letterhead. And it's a nice type letter, hand signed, with their names on it. You know, it's personalized to them, and then you tri-fold it with your card, and it goes inside the thing. You invite them, 250 bucks. You can even do 100. They'll come for 100, too. People are cheap. So, gotcha. yeah, good luck. Thank you. Yeah, good luck, everybody. Thank you. Love that. Uh, the tax idea, the five. The